This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and Think Tech Hawaii is doing a series of Meet the Candidate. From now until primary time, we will meet candidates from all over, from the tip of the Big Island all the way up to the very top, to Nihihau, and everything in between. Places that most of us don't know where or when they are or on the map. We have visited so many wonderful places, and today we are visiting with my dear friend, and those of you that follow, you know I only talk to dear friends, is that we're talking to a dear friend, Colleen Hanabusa, who is running for governor of the state of Hawaii. Aloha, Colleen. Aloha, Marcia. Thank you for having me. This is a real pleasure. I met you, of course you don't remember, when you first entered the legislature. This brand new, I was told all about this brand new attorney from Waianae. And so that's how long, how long has that been? Well, I entered in 99, and so it's not quite 20 years, but pretty close. There it goes, yes. 19 years ago. So tell us, you are born in Waianae. I remember the Hanabusa sign, the big Hanabusa sign. And so tell us about growing up in Waianae. You know, I was born at Queen's Hospital, <laughs> okay. but I grew up in, in Waianae, and I'm fourth generation uh, on the Waianae coast. I have got to tell you, you know, I, when I was going to high school, people would tell me things like, do you feel safe in Waianae? And I'd say, I feel a lot safer in Waianae than the streets of downtown Honolulu. <laughs> because, you know, you're, you're from there, and people know who you are. Growing up in Waianae was, a, was probably an experience that a lot of people could not maybe relate to because we didn't have much in Waianae in terms of, you know, uh, government types of uh, infrastructure. You know, I, I tell the story and, and it really is true. The people ask me, why did you decide to run for office? And I said, I it's because when I realized that as a kid growing up, the thing that always bothered me was when we had roller skates, and in those days, Marsha, I'm sure you know them, it was the, the metal wheel metal roller skate. With, with, with a key. With key, yes. The key was a coveted. <laughs> piece of whatever you want to call it, possession that we had. We always wore it around our neck. And it, it, we had no place to skate. So luckily there wasn't much traffic, so we would skate kind of on the asphalt road. Then when they said, well, we're going to have sidewalks, we thought, wow, that's really something. It wasn't really a sidewalk. It was raised asphalt that went just up and down for not even a block. But we were so thrilled because we didn't have anything. Then I remember going to play with my cousins in Kaimuki. They had this thing called concrete sidewalks that went completely around the block. And the amazing thing, Marcia, is when you fall on concrete, it doesn't hurt. When you fall on asphalt, you end up digging these little black things out of your knee. So I said, this just isn't fair. It isn't right. And that's something that I've always held. And that's what growing up in Waianae was. However, also growing up in Waianae was the amazing, the amazing parts of it. Like, you know, I've always said that the Waianae Coast could represent the 17-mile drive. If you ever went down all the way to the end to Yokohama, what we call Yokohama, you would see that it was it's a, one of the most beautiful coastlines that you could possibly experience on this island. So there's that. I grew up fishing with my family, and so, you know, we knew so many of the nooks and crannies that people did not know. So growing up in Waianae had its positive, real positive parts. And it also had, as you look back at it, we didn't have as much. But you know what? We may not have known, except for my roller skate experience. Well, <coughs> so then once you, you went to uh, school in Honolulu, though. From eighth grade, right. Mm -hmm. And then to the university? Yes, and then I went, I went away to college for a couple of years, but basically graduated from the University of Hawaii with an undergraduate degree in economics and sociology. 
I have a master's in sociology, and I also have a law degree from the William S. Richardson School of Law. I'm in the second graduate. Second graduating class. class. That's yes. right. That's wonderful. So why did you go into politics, other than to do something about Y and I? It, it really was about Y and I more than anything else because, you know, I'm I'm like so many of my generation. We went to law school. You know, we we all aspire to either have our own firm or or to be a, a partner somewhere. So you know, we just. It, we looked at politics kind of with a slight disdain. Why would anybody do that? Um, but it became an issue for me when I realized that somehow past Kahe Power Plant, why and I just didn't exist to a lot of people. And, and what struck me is when I was thinking about running, I had these coffee hours. And one person told me, do not promise us anything because you're not going to be able to deliver because you're one of 25, just promise us that people will know there's a Y and I and you represented us when you're through. And do you recognize where you are? Yes, I do recognize where I am. Isn't See, it beautiful? It is beautiful, isn't it? And right over your shoulder is the eye of Akua, mm. taking right. good care of you. I hope so. <laughs> so, again, what, where is it now that you've been in Congress? Why did you want to go to Congress of all places? Why would you want to go to D.C.? You know, I tell people it was my political journey. And I think at that time I may not have thought about it as such. But as many people know, you know, Senator Inouye was somebody who, who started to mentor me. And he told me that he says, you'd be very good in Congress. And he said, you should... You should uh, run for the position when, when Governor Abercrombie basically vacated the seat. So I did. And I looked at it more as a challenge because the ultimate legislature in the world is really the Congress of the United States. And I don't think anybody who really decides to lead Hawaii, that you have to kind of have that inside because we are no longer just isolated in the 50th state. We are part of a really a global economic base, but more importantly than that, we are the most forward state in Indo-Pacific, which is going to define this century. You know, President Obama said, of course he called it Asia Pacific then, the 21st century will be defined by Asia Pacific. And he said that's whether we live in conflict but we live in cooperation, and we all know how true those words are today. And uh, Hillary Clinton was the Secretary of State then, and she said, and do not forget, Hawaii is the gateway to Asia Pacific. Those words have always resonated with me, and that's something that I have felt, that it was something that going to Congress, understanding how it operates, especially sitting on armed services and the committees that really affect Hawaii, armed services and natural resources, I think that it's it's just given me such a rounded experience that I can come back to Hawaii now and ask people for their support to be governor because of everything that I've done. And as you know, I was in the legislature for 12 years and then, and in the Congress for a total of six very shortly. And it, it, it's that complete package that I think I offer. Well, now, you said you were in the Armed Services Committee. Mm -hmm. You were one of the bipartisan voters right. for this last bill mm -hmm. in May mm -hmm. that I am drawing a blank with the title of it. The National Defense Authorization Act. And it is the one that spells out for, with Senator Akaka's name in the bill and uh, Senator uh, McCain, and I don't remember the other gentleman's name, and it talked about, it's specifically dealt with those places about the rural areas and the care and allows the veterans to go other places. And I'm drawing a blank on the title of the bill. So can you tell us about that? Because that I think is locally is so important. You know, and, and, and Marsha, I do know your strong commitment to the Korean War vets in particular, and you're committed to all veterans, but I know you are 
there almost uh, religiously on Tuesdays at Leaky Leaky <laughs> with those those veterans. And yes, I think I think the bill you're talking about is the veterans bill, and and you you are correct. Uh, Senator Akaka for a very long time chaired the Veterans Affairs Committee and of course we all know S Senator yeah. McCain and I'm drawing a blank on the third name as well and and I think that what what you saw in that bill was a recognition that we had to rethink a lot of how those services are being rendered to them and I think that that's that was the essence of that bill so there right now there are provisions uh, in the bill to, that would allow people to, if they cannot get a certain kind of service, that you can almost go into the private sector and get it. And those are the kinds of things that people are finally listening to the veterans and their plight. Well, with so many veterans here in Hawaii, it seems to me that uh, somehow they're overlooked in the campaigning, they're overlooked with the veterans. And so I just felt that it was absolutely necessary for you to address that since your name is part of the bill. Well, you know, it's, um, I, I think that we all know that the veterans is a, that's, that is a major block of votes. And that it's also, so when I'm like visiting on Maui, I always uh, stop by and see them. The Molokai ones are also very important. And one of the things that uh, people may not realize is that we are going to have to kick it up because in 2016 there was supposed to be a, a veteran center built and it gave uh, there's about 40 some odd million dollars set aside for that and it gave the state two years to comply with everything it needed to comply with uh, our state unfortunately hasn't done it so now there's going to be an issue as to whether or not uh, they're going to be able to get an extension and if not they're going to, they, they informed the congressional delegation that we may have to step in and ask for the extension on their behalf or we're going to lose the funding and we're going to have, we have a veteran center on Oahu that's at risk and also one at, on Maui. Well, speaking of monies not being used, um, Hawaiian homes. Mm -hmm. Thirty million dollars. I don't know if they had to return it. They didn't get it. What happened with Hawaiian homes? I, I think the thirty million uh, is really what they did not get, and it's it's uh, because we would and I went from the time I was originally in Congress. I literally would be up at three o'clock in the morning, arguing for the inclusion of Hawaiian homes funding in under Nahasda, which is the uh, basically a Native American Housing Assistance Self-Determination Act. So it's really one originally for the American Indians and, and uh, Native Hawaiians were tacked on to that. It was President Obama who actually zeroed them out because they had about 60 something million dollars that they could not convince HUD that they were actually spending. So he said, and he warned them before that, that your inability to spend this money and account for it is going to result with you being zeroed out. So they have been zeroed out. We've been able to get placeholders, one or two million, about two million a year, which is a far cry from the, I think the maximum they received at any one time was 13 million a year and then nine million. And the real task is that we're not going to have that law be authorized at the rate that we're going because of the inability to to use the money. Well, we need to take a break and we'll come back in just a minute and then I want to talk about some more monies that aren't spent with the DOE. So we'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Guys, don't forget to check me out right here, The Prince of Investing. I'm your host, 
Prince Dykes, each and every Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Hawaii time. I'm going to be right here. Stop by here from some of the best investment minds across the globe in real estate, finances, stocks, hedge funds, managers, all that great stuff. Thank you. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we at Think Tech are doing a series of shows dedicated to the candidates that are running for office and our election, primary election, which in Hawaii is the biggest thing going, is August 11. In fact, early voting has already started. So today we are visiting with my dear friend, Colleen Hanabusa, who is running for governor. She is now currently a member of Congress. And well, your term ends? It'll end uh, sometime in the first week of January, oh. technically. That's technically. When, technically, yes. but it'll probably end. We probably will not go back. Uh, after close to the holidays. Okay, great. So now, we were talking about monies being returned or not spent. The DOE mm -hmm. has, again, monies that aren't being spent. Now, as governor, there are what, 18 departments and agencies right. that the governor has, is the head of. Some of that looks like there is no management, and the DOE is one of them, as I see it. Um, he talked about cooling 1,200 rooms, and there's 253 public schools, charter schools, and the university who have buildings that are deferred maintenance, that are falling apart. What about that? What, where does the money in the DOE go? And why is it that they are not using it all or giving it back or whatever? Well, I, I think that the um, what people forget is that, you know, I, I, of course, believe in our Constitution. And our Constitution has said that the policy considerations of the DOE are to be made by the Board of Education. So that's why we've had the battle between an elected board and an appointed board. And now, as you know, they're appointed. I was one who advocated for the appointed board because I believe that the accountability of the board should fall on, on the, the governor, the state. In other words, whether the board is doing its job or not doing its job, it should fall on the, on the, the governor. And in addition to that, the board is who selects the superintendent of education because in this case she is to reflect the philosophies of the board. What is very interesting, however, is that the, the Department of Education also does not uh, really establish the money in terms of the capital improvement projects. That's done usually by the legislature because the legislature has traditionally really used that as, as symbols of how they have worked for their community. So that's separate from the board, though I think maintenance, uh, which you raised, is something that is usually lump sum to the, to, the, to the department, and then the department and the board goes through and determines who's going to be funded. They will always say that we do not have enough money, and that's, that's the problem. And even with the issue of the, the quote, the, the cooling of the classrooms, or originally as the air conditioning as the classroom, as you know, the, the governor originally said he would do that at no cost to the taxpayers, but he was going to use a special fund called GEMS, which the attorney general said was unconstitutional to use that. So the legislature had to step in again and funded $100 million to, to do that initiative. But it wasn't the governor's initiative. It was an initiative that was longstanding. I think if you go back to the time of Neil Abercrombie, for example, he had a more... Um, systematic view on it because he was saying okay we we need to cool but in addition to needing to cool we need to find how we're going to create the quote the source of energy because a lot of the problems and the issues that you will find like you said with the older buildings is it doesn't have the transformer capabilities or the ability to run a true air conditioning system when i first got elected 
We AC'd the whole Maile Elementary, including its cafeteria. It's the only AC cafeteria. And the, the problem we had was the transformer capability. So luckily, Hawaiian Electric stepped up and said, OK, we'll increase the, the transformer loads. If they didn't do that, you couldn't run an AC and plug in a computer. Yeah. The, the, they would fry. So, you know, it's, it's these kinds of issues that when we talk about how we're going to catch up, it's, it's really a lot of details to get there. You just can't say, I'm going to give you an air conditioning unit. You, you have to think about, okay, how does it all fit in? And if you do that, are you going to be able to have other really needs, like computers? Can they operate and can they coexist? So those are the things, but those issues to me are one with the board, and the board is the, technically supposed to reflect the governor's philosophy, and then they have to then make the policy decisions of the department. Well, what about special needs children? You know, we had the Felix consent, and now we're back again, that they haven't done, haven't met those needs. What about that? Where do we go from here? Well, you know, um, I chaired, I co-chaired the Felix Investigative Committee. And even at the end of that committee, uh, the one thing that I, I always said publicly is that the department uh, had no handle over a group called autistic children. And that they would not be able, and until they uh, began to understand autism, we would have it as a, quote, almost a category where they would put children in. And it would result with, like you're saying, potentially another challenge. Because the concept of the, the special needs is IDEA and Section 504 federal laws. And that was what was being enforced. I think that every child should be entitled to, in that case, they, they use the word FAPE, which is a fair, uh, 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 fair and appropriate public education. So it had to be something that was uh, free, and but it appropriate, so it wasn't anything that gave them more. But notwithstanding that, that is the criteria. And it is one that the children are entitled to. The problem is going to be if the department doesn't recognize that they still haven't come to grips with autism, for example, and other challenges that the children may have, they will probably be looking at another consent decree. And that means the federal court is going to step in and run it again. Well, I don't, I view you know, that the state, as a state, tends to overlook the disabled community completely. And, and there are no two disabilities alike. Mm -hmm. You know, people that don't hear, people that are blind, people that are crippled, the veterans with all of the issues, right. they, the disabilities, children that are, you know, born with different things. How can we look at being more inclusive, caring more, doing more, so that these people, for instance, in Mexico, they have uh, leather uh, runways, so you can take a wheelchair into the ocean. And simple little things like that that would make the visitor in, uh, experience different. Little things that we just don't see disabled people. We just don't see them. I, I, you know, I agree with you on that. And so after my Felix experience, I will tell you that during the interim between my two stints in, in Congress, I did sit on the board of an entity called GEMS, and it's a Gracie Morikawa. Uh, and GEMS was uh, really targeted to assist the, the hearing impaired or the mm -hmm. deaf community. And unless you're in their shoes, or, or at least try to understand what it is for them, you, you, can't, you can't begin to understand it. I've, I've always felt that with the hearing impaired community, uh, the problem is that they look like there's, you know, you can't tell that they're no, challenged can't. in any way. And, and then people get offended sometimes because if you're not, if they're not talking to you face to face and some of them can le read lips and others sign and only sign, you know, you, you think, well, well, they're not paying attention, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the worst part. But I, I've always believed that society defines itself by how it treats our seniors, 
how it treats our disabled population and, and how it treats our youth. I mean, that's, that's us. So unless we begin to look at how we're doing or we're failing to meet these needs, we, we are not going to be the society that we can be. And we've got to have more people sensitized to exactly what the needs are. Now, yes, speaking of needs, we have an incredible homeless population. Mm -hmm. And the city tends to label them either uh, addicts or mentally ill. And I think there's a category that is not being mentioned. And that is the people that make $10 an hour and the rent is $1,800 a month. So many of them uh, don't have an address. We tend not to think about them. So in the little time left, talk to us about that group of homeless. We know yes. about the others. Talk, to, talk us about that. That's the group that, that should be the, um, the easiest to address. And it is a matter of then having some form of affordable rentals. And as you know, this past legislative session, in honor of Bob Nakata, the legislature infused $200 million into the Rental Housing Trust Fund to really address those kinds of needs. And the way we do it is not by selling off selling off these housing projects that are meant to do affordables or seniors. We don't do it that way. And that's unfortunately been what this administration has done. So we need to hold that inventory. And I will tell you, one of the things that, that uh, I'm, uh, I, I did when I was still uh, in the legislature is Kukui Gardens. There was Kukui Gardens under the federal program was expired in terms of done its 30 years and it can go market. So we intervened, and it was with Governor Lingo. We intervened, and we said, no, we can't do that, or we'll have 800 people basically on the streets with no place to go. And these are people who were working, but they were surviving because they were in Kukui Gardens. So we were able to purchase half the units, let, gave it to a nonprofit, not gave the unit, we kept the title, but gave the operations to a nonprofit who is doing a great job for, for keeping them in housing. Those are the things that we need to look and we need to recognize. We need to understand our inventory, understand who the needs are, and don't aggravate the situation by doing away with, with that group of population by not addressing their needs. Well, this has been really fast, but I want you to look right into the camera mm -hmm. over here and tell us why we should vote for you. Thank you, Martha. And thank you, thank you and thank Tink Tech for having this. The reason I'm here to ask for your vote and support in the upcoming election is because I want all of you to know that the decision to come home to run was not an easy one, but it was a decision made because one, I believe my political journey brings me to this place and because I believe you all deserve better. People have told me we're rudderless, and we just don't seem to have direction and there is no vision. You can't do things in the fourth year of an administration and try to portray it like this is something that's been going on for the whole time. That is not what this is about. So please, when you look at me, I hope you see someone who is not same old, same old. Somebody who does have a vision, more importantly than all of that, has such a great love for Hawaii understanding what it is that we all need for to play in the Pacific, but more importantly than that, to keep our people here, to keep the young here, so that we can continue to be that very special place. So vote for me is a vote to ensure Hawaii's place in the world and ensure our people continue to be the special people that they are. Thank you, Martha. Aloha. Aloha. And we'll see you next time. Don't